to you guys via email. Uh, uh, Artemis is also teaching um, in the Netherlands, so that might be a great way. And this is one of her books, uh, Artemis. So we're going to give a couple of those away today. All right. I, I say without further ado and no other emails, everybody seems to have gotten in pretty quickly this morning. Yes. All right. Wade, here we go. <laughs> and Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought. And today, we are going to have a fantastic conversation with my friend, Dr. Tanya Harrison, who, if you can find her on um, kind of like her social media, she likes to be called Tanya of Mars. So she's going to share a lot of great things with us. And I've got some books. She autographed them and even included NASA stickers. So uh, there'll be a challenge here at the end. And a couple of people will uh, be receiving this when I put it in the mail this afternoon. So without further ado, everybody give a good virtual hand clap to Dr. Tanya Harrison. Whee! Take it away. Hey everybody, thanks for dialing in this morning. Um, we're gonna talk today about some of the things that we've seen on Mars and the stuff that the rovers and the landers that are there right now are doing. And there'll be some quiz questions kind of uh, here and there throughout the middle. It might be a little hard to unmute. Um, I don't know, Janet, is it easier for you to unmute everybody to give answers or should I ask them to like hold up their hands? Here's what we'll do is I will, if you kind of go, Janet, I'm about to ask a question. Here's what we'll do, everyone. I will unmute you, but you will be sworn to the vacuum of space where there is no sound. And the first person that I see, I hear or see say buzzer, that's who will get to answer. All right. <laughs> so those are kind of our expectations. All right. Okay. So let me just share some slides here. And while you're doing that, Jesse, I see your hand raised. You got a quick question before we get started? Let me see what Jesse's question was. Where were you there, Jess? Did you have your hand raised, Jess? No, okay, you're good. All right, go right for it. Okay, great. Uh, are the slides showing up all right? Okay. Uh, so, like, like Janet said, I'm Dr. Tanya Harrison, and I call myself a professional Martian because I've spent the last a uh, little more than 10 years working on different NASA Mars missions, including some of the rovers and then satellites that we have in orbit of Mars as well. So we'll go over some stuff that we've learned about Mars with the different missions that we've sent there so far, and then a little overview of what we're doing there right now. And then we'll take a little peek at what we're going to be doing on Mars this year and in the years to come. So Mars is one of our closest neighbors in the solar system. Depending on the time of the year and where we are in our orbits, sometimes it's the closest planet to us, sometimes Venus is closer to us, but it's the next planet out in the solar system. So the Earth is the third planet from the sun and Mars is the fourth planet from the sun. And we have a lot of things in common, but there's a lot of stuff that's different too. And one of the big things is that Mars is only about a third of the size of the Earth, which means it only has about the third of the gravity. So if you weigh 100 pounds on Earth, you would only weigh 33 pounds on Mars. And since Mars is farther away from the sun than the Earth is, the year on Mars is longer as well. So here on Earth, our year is 365 days long. And on Mars, a year is 687 Earth days long. But the days on Mars are also longer than they are here on Earth. They're about 40 minutes longer. So when we talk about days on Mars, we call them sols, which is short for solar day. So if we look at how many Mars days or how many sols a year is on Mars, it's 669 days long. So this is your first question to see uh, how many of you might already know some things about Mars. How many moons do you think Mars has? Five. Two. 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 Buzzer. Two. Buzzer. Two. Buzzer. 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 I'm going to mute you, Tynan, because I saw you and uh, some of you did not 
adhere to the vacuous space. <laughs> Tynan, my new friend, uh, can you tell me how many? Tynan. Two. Two. All right. Now, vacuum okay. space. Shh. Vacuum in space. Here is for a bonus. Anybody know what they might be called? Buzzer. Okay, Jack. Buzzer. Jack got it. Deimos and Phobos. Woohoo! All right, you're going back to mute. Okay. Yeah. Now, Tanya, that may mean you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> I hope not. All right, and that was our next thing, our next slide. How do we know? All right, continue, my friend. Yeah, can you still hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so you were right, Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, and their names mean fear and panic because Mars in Roman mythology was the god of war. And so a lot of stuff on Mars or associated with Mars tends to have names along those themes. And the moons of Mars are a little bit weird. They're not like our moon and they're not like a bunch of the moons in the outer solar system around like Jupiter or Saturn. They're kind of wonky and potato shaped. And we think that they might be either asteroids that came from the asteroid belt and got thrown toward the inner part of the solar system and they got trapped in orbit around Mars. Or there might have been a huge asteroid that slammed into Mars at some point, shot a bunch of rocks off, and some of those got stuck in Mars orbit. And these are just a couple of them that are left. Um, Japan is going to send a mission to Mars in 2024 to study the moon specifically. So that might help us understand better where these came from. One of the cool things is- And which moon is that, Tanya? Which, the, the Japanese, it's like, which, are they going to which moon did you say? Uh, they're going to go to both moons, I think, or at least fly by both of them. I don't know if they're gonna land on any of them. Um, so for this one, you guys can just raise your hands because I can see you on my screen. How many of you saw the eclipse a couple of summers ago? Cool, so a lot of you. So the, the pictures on the top here are pictures from that eclipse a few summers ago. And the eclipses happen when the moon passes between us here on Earth and the sun. And when it happens here on Earth, the size of the moon in the sky is exactly the same size as the disk of the sun. And so when the moon covers up the sun, we get to see this wispy outer part called the corona, which is the outermost part of the atmosphere of the sun. We get eclipses on Mars too, but since the moons are so small compared to the size of the sun in the sky, the eclipses don't look as pretty, but it's still really cool. So on the bottom here are views of Phobos causing an eclipse as viewed from the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. And we've even gotten video of this from the rovers. So this is not in real time. It takes about six hours for Phobos to go around Mars more than once. But this is what the eclipses look like in video form from the rovers on the surface looking toward the sun. So now it's time for your next quiz question. Do you know why Mars is red? All right. So, okay. Everybody better be in the vacuum of space before I unmute you. All right. Buzzer. 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 All right, Ander, I think you got it. Ander. Um, Mars is red because the rusting, because Mars is made of rusted metal particles. And rusted metal. It's called ion. It's called ion and <laughs> It's called iron. Well, I know my element very well. Yes, you do indeed. All right, you guys. So, how about we learn a little bit called iron oxide, right? Ah, uh, yes, iron oxide. Yeah, so. All right, so all right, I mean, I'm gonna keep score from now on, but you guys are all going, hey, my little peach, you're gonna be muted again. There you go. Thank you. And continue, Miss uh, Dr. Harrison. You guys know way more about Mars than a lot of the classes I talk to, so this is really cool and about science, <laughs> so this is great. So, uh, you were right. Mars is covered in a layer of basically rusty dust. And this is because most of the rocks on Mars are really high in iron. And if you think about what metal is like on the earth, 
a lot of times it tends to be like iron. It will be like a gray silver color, but then if it sits outside for a really long time, it will start to rust and turn red. And that's because when the metal interacts with the oxygen in our atmosphere, that's what causes it to rust and turn red. On Mars, the, there's not much of an atmosphere, but there's enough and enough oxygen in the atmosphere that it has caused these rocks to what we call oxidize. They've started to go rusty. But if you brush away that top layer of the dust, just underneath that, Mars is actually still pretty gray. It looks like the moon or Mercury. Um, so it's not actually the red planet. It's just, just is hiding under this layer of rust. And we'll see what that looks like in a few slides. So your next question, this might be a little chaotic, but uh, what kind of things have we seen on Mars so far? Oh, Janet, I think you're on mute. I know, it's like my tr trigger finger was not working correct <laughs> this morning. All right, so the best, smartest kids in the whole solar system are right here on this call. Go to the vacuum of space. I'm unmuting you all. Buzzer. 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 Yep. All right. Buzzer. Go to mute again. All right. Here's what we're doing. So we're coming to. Thank you. I want to go to my friends down in Cape Town, uh, South Africa. So Seth and William. Where are you so I can unmute you? Is there a way that I can unmute you guys? Unmute yourself there. I know you have it. It's hard in this in the screen sharing thing. I'm gonna unmute everybody so I can get to you. But Seth, Mom, Beth, and William, let me hear from you guys. I need two things. Yes, so Seth and uh, William down in Cape Town, Africa. What kinds of things have we seen on Mars? I know, I think so. All right, I tell you what, let me come around again and take a view here of uh, everybody. Let me go down here, let's see. Who else has their hand raised? Ask where you can find it. Ask him Emmett, him Emmett, do you know? All right. Who else? Can't find it. All right, Jesse, do you know what we some what kinds of things we've seen? Can someone anymore? message me the password? These lake-like holes we have on the surface doing. and craters. Yeah, lake-like holes. Okay. Craters, so, etc. Gale crater. Yeah, Gale crater. All right, Victoria, oh, yes. I see your hand. Ice. Ice. All right, permafrost. All right. Anybody else want to tell me something? Like, is the ice, ice only up at the poles or? Eat everywhere. Oh, you know what? Let's switch back to uh, Dr. Tanya I and know to that question. Yep. All right. Dr. Tanya, what do you think? It's not just at the polls. Um, I'll actually show that in a few slides. So um, we'll hold on for that question. Yeah. So how about you enlighten us? Because it is a tiny bit chaotic, and uh, but I love the chaos. Uh, <laughs> Tell us a little bit, and I tell you what, guys, why don't we do this? Why don't you send some answers to me in chat uh, right now uh, if you didn't get to tell your, um, tell your idea. So send me some chats about what you uh, know or what kinds of things we've seen on Mars, and I'll share, okay? Cool. But what so kind of things have we seen on Mars, Tanya? So one of the things that we've seen a lot of on Mars are volcanoes. There are hundreds of volcanoes all over the surface of Mars, and they're absolutely huge. They tend to be way bigger than volcanoes on Earth. The arrows in this image are pointing to just a few of the big volcanoes. And from this view, you can't even see the hundreds of smaller volcanoes that are in this same area. So this is a view from a European spacecraft called Mars Express. And it gets really far away from Mars and looks at it at these really cool angles where we can actually see things like the atmosphere. So this little blue line that's above the edge at the top here, that's actually the atmosphere of Mars hanging out above the surface. And Mars has the biggest volcano in the whole solar system called Olympus Mons. And this thing is three times taller than Mount Everest, which is the tallest mountain here on Earth. And the base of it is about the size of the state of Arizona. So this thing is huge. It's, it's absolutely huge. 
And it's the same kind of volcanoes like the ones that we see in Hawaii. We call them shield volcanoes. So instead of being like a really steep volcano, like we might think of when we think about volcanoes on Earth a lot of the time, it's actually really shallow. So you could actually, if you had a spacesuit and you wanted to walk really far, you could walk up Olympus Mons and down the other side and you probably wouldn't even break a sweat because it's not very steep. Um, it's a great place to go hiking if you've got all the right equipment. This is a great thing. Are there volcanoes on Mars that are still active? That came in from Victoria, my little super wonder girl. That's a really great question. We've, we've looked ever since we got there in the 1960s and we haven't seen any volcanoes erupting on Mars today. It looks like they probably haven't erupted in about 10 million to 100 million years. Um, so we think that all the volcanoes right now are dead. That's a really good question. Awesome. Mars also has, uh, continuing the theme of really big things on the surface, Mars has the largest valley in the whole solar system called Mariner Valley, which was named after the Mariner 9 spacecraft that went to Mars back in 1971. And that's the mission that discovered this because we weren't able to see it with any of the missions that flew by Mars before. And you can't really see it very well with telescopes here on the ground. We don't entirely know how this thing formed. It looks like it's a combination of maybe some action of water flowing, um, a bunch of landslides that have made this thing get wider over time, and maybe some stress on the crust of Mars. So these dark spots over on the left, those are three of the huge volcanoes on Mars. Olympus Mons is like just around the corner where we can't see it. And the force of those pushing up from underneath the ground as they formed might have caused the ground over in this area where the valley is to crack wide open. And then over time, it's just been getting bigger and bigger due to what we call erosion. So wind and water and things like that. And if we plot the size of this valley on a map of the United States, this gives you an idea of how big it is. So this thing stretches farther across than the entire width of the United States. Now, if we were to look at, say, the Grand Canyon on this map, you wouldn't even see it. It's like one tiny pixel in this whole giant view. And the Grand Canyon is pretty big. It's not the biggest canyon on the Earth, but it's up there. And this thing on Mars is so much bigger. If you stood at the edge of it, you probably wouldn't even see the other side. That's how big it is. You wouldn't realize where you were standing on the surface of Mars. Mars also has sand dunes like we have on the Earth. And these are really handy because when we see things on Mars that we also have on Earth, that means we generally know how they formed. And so it tells us something about Mars that we can learn without having to go there physically with a rover on the surface or with a human there. And this is a really handy case. Sand dunes on Earth point in the direction that the wind is blowing somewhere. So in the Earth example here, the image that's in color, the wind is blowing from the top of the image toward the bottom of the image. So the little two spiky parts, we call those the horns, the horns point in the direction of the wind. Now this view on Mars, these are some dunes inside the top of one of the big volcanoes. And we don't have any instruments on the surface that are measuring the wind here, but the dunes can tell us that the wind was blowing from sort of the upper right corner toward the lower left corner of the image. These dunes aren't super active today. Like on Earth, they actually move over time. If you look at them from space, you can watch them like migrate over the surface. On Mars, they move a little bit, but not very much. So this tells us actually more about what the wind used to be like on Mars when these were forming, but not necessarily what the wind is doing today. Hey, a couple of questions are coming in. What, the one is from uh, Jennifer Wagaman, what is the ice made of? And then my friend Lucas wants to know, are there Mars quakes? Um, I'm going to answer both those questions in a few slides. So we'll hold off on answering them uh, right now. I'm just rearranging my windows here slightly so I can see everything. Um, so one of the other things that we see on the surface of Mars are dust devils. And these are kind of like little tornadoes. They form on Earth when the wind, or sorry, when the ground gets really warm and the air above it 
is a little bit colder. When this happens, it causes a little wind disturbance and it picks up dust off the surface and it forms these little spirals that go across the ground. We see them on Earth a lot in places like Arizona, but they tend to be a lot smaller than the ones we see on Mars. So the example here from Earth is from Arizona. And then the one from Mars here is a dust devil where that white part is the actual dust devil. The black part behind it is the shadow being cast onto the surface behind it. And sometimes we'll even see what we call dust devil tracks and they'll be like little scribbly lines all over the place that show us where these dust devils were and the, the path that they took across the surface of Mars. Sometimes it kind of looks like a painting. It's almost artistic, which is really cool. We've also seen these Hi, dust devils. I'm so sorry. Can we go back to your dunes there? Artemis yeah. wanted to know, are these Barken dunes that you're showing in uh, Tunisia? Do you know? Where those are? Um, they are Barkan dunes. I don't remember where on earth these ones are. It's been a while since I made this slide. Can you explain to everybody what Barkan dunes are? Yeah, so dunes have different names based on the shape, and the shape tells us about the direction of the wind. So Barkans have this little, I don't know what you want to call it, horned crescent shape. Um, and the horns point in the direction of the wind blowing. We have a few other kinds too. There's some called longitudinal dunes that are just like big long lines. Um, and they, they are aligned in the direction that the wind blows. There's also star shaped dunes. If you have a place where the wind has just been changing directions all the time, so it hasn't really given you like one nice direction, the dunes just kind of point in these star shaped starfish, I said starship, think in space here, starfish shapes pointing all over the place. Um, oh gosh, there's, there's a few other kinds too, but those are like the main ones that we typically see on Mars. We see a lot of these Barkan dunes and we see a lot of the longitudinal dunes. Awesome. Let me let you let me ask one more question before uh, you proceed. And thank you so much. Jesse wants to know, have you ever found water on Mars or any small lakes in Vallis Marineris? We haven't seen any lakes that are there today in terms of like liquid water still being there, but there are places where we can tell there used to be lakes. Um, and we'll talk about that in a few slides as well. So we'll, we'll circle back to that one. You guys have such great questions. I'm glad that you already know so much about Mars. This is really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Martians on this call, I assure you. You've been prepared. Let's see. So going back to the dust devils, we've actually seen them on the surface of Mars with the rovers that we have there. And this is a video from the Spirit rover taken a little over 10 years ago. And if you see these white wispy areas, these are the dust devils. There's this big one in the front here, but if you keep an eye out in the background, you'll see a few tiny ones like in the distance go, come up and go away as well. And these ended up being really helpful to us actually. When we landed the rovers on Mars, Spirit and Opportunity back in 2004, we had estimated that they were only gonna last for about 90 sols, 90 Martian days. And that was based on how much dust we thought was going to settle out of the air onto the solar panels of the rovers because their batteries are charged up by solar panels. And if you got too much dust on them, you wouldn't get enough power to the batteries to keep the rovers going. So they were probably only going to last for 90 days. But then these dust devils started coming by and they cleaned off the solar panels for us year after year after year. And so we managed to get about 10 years out of the Spirit Rover and 15 years out of opportunity before unfortunately a dust storm came by that we didn't manage to clean the panels off enough from for opportunity and the batteries died. And Spirit got stuck in some sand. Uh, and so we weren't able to get the solar panels at a good angle during winter to keep the battery charged up. And so the batteries on Spirit died. But these missions lasted way, way longer than we expected. And a lot of it has to do with these dust devils coming through. So they've been a huge help to us on the surface of Mars. And we've got some great questions coming in and you may be getting to these, but I'll just 
ask them. And then if you hear your question asked, be listening as she probably is answering or will answer some of these things. I remember talk to, talking to Dr. Jim Rice and he said it would be like they as mission specialists would be looking and hoping that a dust storm would come through and then some great really high wind and dust would blow it off and you guys would have power again. So that's kind of fantastic. They work in this yeah. way. Jesse's question was, so would you call these like Mars tornadoes in a way, these dust storms? They're not quite tornadoes because tornadoes form from a different type of disturbance in the atmosphere. We've never seen something like an actual tornado. Um, it's just the easiest way to describe for folks that maybe don't live in a place where dust devils happen. So I use that to describe like what they look like and how they move. But technically from like a weather standpoint, they're not actually tornadoes. Fantastic. And again, that would be your homework, Jesse. Tornadoes, remember, in that tornadic at, at, uh, kind of like activity usually forms in kind of the upper atmosphere and kind of cycles down. So that'll be some good stuff for you to do. There was another question that came up and I'm trying to get back to it. Uh, and it was about does the, does the thin atmosphere of Mars at all affect some of the shape of these dunes? Uh, that was one question. And then are there frozen water under the place where you guys found lakes? Um, so the dunes look like they probably formed back when Mars had a thicker atmosphere because it needed a little more oomph behind it to move this sand around to make these dunes. Right now, Mars is really good at blowing dust around, but the dust is like the size of um, pieces of maybe, if you've ever seen like baby powder or talcum powder. Uh, and sand is much, much bigger. So it's a lot harder for wind to move it in an atmosphere like Mars. So these things probably formed hundreds of millions of years ago, if not more, when there was more, uh, more atmosphere to blow it around. Um, in terms of ice, we yeah. haven't seen ice directly in some of the places where we knew that there were lakes, but we have seen some ice in places like um, the Phoenix Lander dug up some ice in the northern latitudes of Mars. It had a little scoop to dig trenches around it and we found ice underground. Um, we've also seen impact craters that have formed in the last decade or so that have excavated ice. So it was underground, something smashed into the surface of Mars, and then we saw it bring up ice and put it on the surface for us to see. And um, I don't have slides of those in here, but I can bring up some slides that show that in a little bit, um, like once these slides are over, if you guys want to see what that ice looks like. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. So speaking of ice, that's a good transition. Uh, Mars has ice, not just in the polar caps, but in other places as well. Um, I'll bring up the other ice slides. Actually, I'll just open them right now. But uh, a lot of ice on Mars is locked up in the polar caps. The northern polar cap of Mars is made up of water ice, so the kind of ice that you just get out of your freezer. The southern polar cap of Mars is made up of dry ice. And I guess if you guys just want to raise your hands, because I can see you, um, how many of you have played with dry ice before? A few of you, okay. So you might have seen it at like a science center or maybe like YouTube videos where they have a chunk of ice and sitting on the counter or something and it's steaming away. That's because this dry ice, it's made up of carbon dioxide and on earth the air pressure is too high and the temperature is too high. So carbon dioxide doesn't wanna stay in the form of ice. It wants to turn into a gas. But at the South Pole of Mars, it can get down to like negative 180 degrees. And so that carbon dioxide can stay in the form of ice year after year after year. Um, over time, the sizes of these polar caps actually change, which is pretty cool. I'm gonna see if I can open the, these slides and if they'll still show up for you. Um, are you seeing a slide of the North Polar Cap in spring and summer? Or is it still showing my old slides? Still showing your old slides. You might have to uh, click to or stop, yeah. and reshare. Yeah, stop and reshare. You guys are being so awesome out there. I'm so tickled. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Here we go. Early spring and summer. 
So the polar caps, and this is something not a lot of people know, uh, the polar caps on Mars actually change over the course of seasons. There's enough water in the atmosphere that in um, winter time, it condenses out onto the surface as frost. And then as you go from spring into summer, that frost goes back into the air as water vapor, so in, into a gas. So this is what the northern polar cap looks like at the beginning of spring, just as soon as it comes off the night side of the planet. So we can't actually really take pictures of the northern polar cap of Mars in winter because it's on the dark side of the planet. Um, but this is a snapshot of what it looks like as soon as it turns to be daytime. And then on the right, we have the view of what the polar cap looks like in summer. So the stuff in the summer view is what we call the residual polar cap. And that's the part that doesn't really change uh, over the course of multiple years. The stuff that we see in the spring part that is not there in the summer is what we call the, um, the seasonal polar cap. And this comes and goes throughout the seasons. And if we wanna see what this looks like at the South Pole, a lot of this is carbon dioxide frost, but some of it is water frost. And this is a video of the cap actually retreating as we go from spring into summer. So if you keep an eye on the edges here, especially some of these big craters, you can actually watch the cap get smaller. So that's pretty cool. I really oh, love Oh, that is super cool. Wow. Hey, a question's coming in. Uh, and uh, would the North Pole be where we would want to get water if we live on Mars? Would there be a way to capture that and turn it into potable, drinkable water for us? Maybe. It might be hard at the polar cap because it's really cold and stormy up there. So where we might want to go are the northern mid to high latitudes instead. And that's where Phoenix landed. So this is the place where we landed a lander back in 2007. And we could see that there was ice under the ground because of these we call polygons. And on Earth, we see these in places like the Canadian Arctic, where there's ice underground. And when you have freeze thaw, it makes these polygons. So we landed and thought there was ice here. And then after a few days on the ground with the rover, we started digging these trenches. And the view here, the thing that says Sol 20, so this was the 20th day of the Phoenix mission, we ended up digging up these chunks of ice. We've also seen ice, I mentioned the impact craters. So we've taken so many pictures of Mars at this point that we have places where you have one image where there's no crater. And then we have an image of the same area taken days, weeks, months, sometimes years later where you can see a crater. And usually we can see them because it forms a dark spot on the surface. These, these uh, asteroids come in, or I guess it's a meteorite at that point, these meteorites come in, they blast away the dust on the surface and they make it look like this dark spot with all the light toned dust that's still there around it. But one time we started finding these that had light toned spots around them. And we thought, well, this is weird. We've never seen these before. So we started looking at them with different instruments that we have on the satellites in orbit. And we found out that this was made up of water ice. And we found a few dozen of these at this point. So we know that there's water ice just barely below the surface, like a couple of inches below the surface all over the northern latitudes of Mars. So these are places that we would probably want to land a mission for humans because the ice is really easy to get to and it gets us far enough away from the polar cap that we're not gonna get hit by these gigantic dust storms all the time. And that's a really big problem up in the north. So if you want to see also, like I said, the, the cap, when it goes from frost, it turns back into vapor in the atmosphere in summertime. This is what that looks like. So all of these blue wispy areas here, these are clouds made up of water ice. And if you've ever looked at the sky here on Earth and you see not the big puffy, what we call cumulus clouds, but way up high in the atmosphere, sometimes you'll see these really streaky wispy clouds. Those are called cirrus clouds. And those are the kind that we see on Mars all over the place. I don't have any pictures in these slides, but um, if you Google like clouds on Mars, you can find videos that we've taken with Phoenix and Curiosity of the clouds going overhead, which is really cool. Let me switch back to the other slides now. And one question came in from Jesse uh, was some, he saw something kind of pink and green uh, in the South Pole. Is that was that kind of like a some kind of image with a spectrometer thing he might have been seeing? That's actually what we call an image artifact. So the images that we use to make up the, that particular video, that camera has a really wide fish angle 
or sorry, a wide angle fisheye lens. And the way that it's set up, we have a few different filters on it and the filters don't all cover the whole part of the camera. So when you get to the edge, we get these like pink and green fringes every once in a while. So there's nothing on Mars that's like neon pink or, or neon green. Um, it's just the, the way that that camera works. Sometimes we get these weird little blups and blobs here and there. Beautiful. Uh, two more questions before we move on. Um, could we drink, if we could melt it from the polar caps, could we drink it, is drink the water? And let's see, there were boulder piles on Mars, as our, apparently somebody saw what looked like a bunch of rocks stacked up. Is that true? Yeah, there's a lot of boulders all over the surface of Mars. Um, we see them both with the rovers and we can see them from orbit too the high-rise camera that we have on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter can pick out these boulders if they're big enough. Um, they've generally got to be maybe like the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, then, then we can see them. Um, but yeah, we see a lot of them all over the place. And then the water, from what we can tell, the water on Mars is probably really salty. So we'd need to filter it out to be able to drink it, but we can do that here on Earth. We take the salt out of ocean water all the time. Um, so we just have to make sure that we have the right technology with us that we bring to Mars to be able to do that. All right, keep on going. This is amazing. <laughs> so, so, she's oh. got a question. We're going to change how we answer. First couple of answers that come in via chat is how we're going to do it now. So forget the buzzer, get ready, <laughs> find the chat button. Go ahead, Dr. Tanya. Okay. So how many robots are there on Mars right now that still work, that we're operating today? I'm going to call out some answers here. So from Jesse, we've got four. Jack says two. Uh, Jesse comes back, there's four. Andrew says one. Anybody else got a good guess out there for how many robots are currently active on Mars right now? Uh, Jesse came back with three. Judah says three to four. Jennifer says three. David doesn't know. All right, time. What's okay. the real answer? So Jack got the right answer. It is two Ooh. right now. Um, sometimes I, I ask this question and people will say 15. I'm like, oh man, I wish we had 15 little <laughs> robot cards. So. so the answer is two. Jack, you got that, uh, you got that round right. All right. Congratulations. So um, the, the older of the two missions we have, sometimes this image takes a little bit of time to de-blur because it's really big. Let's see if it's, uh, there we go. So the Curiosity rover got to Mars in, back in 2012. And I heard somebody mention Gale Crater earlier. So that's where Curiosity is. Gale Crater is an absolutely huge crater. It's like a couple hundred miles across and Oh gosh, I'm so bad at converting between miles and kilometers. It's five and a half kilometers deep, however many miles that is. <laughs> um, and you guys, here's the perfect thing. Just like Artemis was talking to us to the other day, had we, when I was about in eighth grade or ninth grade, 1980, 81, we would already be talking kilometers. So if you guys <laughs> want to, oh, oh, and Judah, you have a Mars map. All right, so everybody's, okay, Whoever my statistician is, Jack, you're good at this. Find out how much five and a half kilometers is in miles, and we all get to commit <laughs> to learning the metric system. There we go. Yeah, I usually uh, I have to remember to learn to convert these things for people because, like, uh, we always talk in kilometers when we're working on missions like this. And then when I gave these presentations when I lived in Canada, it, we use the metric system up there, and I would talk about everything in terms of the distance between like Toronto and another city. So I have to like revamp this for other audiences a little bit. You know what, stay in kilometers because that is our goal. We're gonna learn the metric system here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so and the case, answer is 3.1 miles. So that's okay. the equivalent for uh, those five and a half. Cool, thanks for doing the math. So uh, Gale Crater about three and a half to four billion years ago used to be a humongous crater lake. And over time, that lake eventually evaporated away and it left behind a bunch of what we call sedimentary rock. Well, sediments that eventually turned into rock. And on Earth, those are really good at preserving signs of life. 
what we call biosignatures. So we sent Curiosity here to take samples of these rocks that the lake left behind to figure out if the conditions in this lake would have been good for life as we know it. So this is the area that the rover has been driving over. All these platy rocks are pieces of um, things like mudstone. So the muddy, mucky bottom of the lake that left all these rocks behind. And one of the cool things that we've seen with Curiosity, or one of the cool things that we can do with Curiosity is that we can take selfies. And a lot of people ask how the heck we take these pictures because it looks like the rover is just sitting there on the surface of Mars and there's a human standing there taking a picture. Um, but we do this the same way that you take a selfie with your phone. So basically, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can show you guys what this looks like. Essentially, we do this the same way you would take a selfie with your phone. The, the rover has a seven foot long robotic arm and we hold the camera out. There's a camera at the end of the arm of the rover. We hold it out and we take a picture. But just like when you take a selfie with your phone, you don't usually get your whole body in it. It's just your face. So for us to get the whole rover and the landscape around it, we take a line of pictures and then we turn the arm this way and we take another line of pictures. And then we turn the arm this way and take another line of pictures. And after we've taken about 50 to 70 pictures like that, we stitch them all together. And because we've moved the arm like that as we're taking pictures, when you stitch them together, you don't see the arm in view anymore. Sometimes if you look, we'll have some uh, most, we'll have some uh, selfies out there where you can see the shadow of the arm on the ground, but most of the time they try to put it together in a way where you can't see that so it looks cooler. So let me bring the slides back up. So this is the first ro rover where we've ever really been able to do this on Mars. And we don't just do this because the selfies are cool. We do this because it tells us a lot about the rover and the area around it. So we can see things like dust on the deck of the rover. This doesn't matter so much for Curiosity because it's powered by a nuclear battery. So we don't have to worry too much if the rover gets dusty. It's not gonna be a problem like it was with Spirit and Opportunity that were powered by solar panels because the dust won't affect that battery. But it's a good way for us to just get an, an idea of how much dust has settled out of the air onto the deck of the rover. When it landed, that, it was like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Is that a picture of like, kind of like a selfie on a sand dune, Jack yeah. asked? Yep. So all of the dark stuff are sand dunes. And then uh, the lighter stuff on the right side of the image are these like mudstone type rocks from the lake. Um, so when we landed the rover, the rover was really bright white. And we do that because it's highly reflective. So it keeps the thermal properties of the rover really good. It's one of the reasons that you tend to see like when rockets launch, a lot of times rockets are white because we want it to reflect the heat off essentially. Um, there was one company that tried to launch black rockets and they had a lot of thermal problems because it was making the rockets hotter than they would if they had painted them white. Um, so we, even though we, it would be cool to paint the rockets or the rovers, like tons of colors, like, I don't know, neon pink or bright red or like put racing stripes on them, it's actually not good for the thermal. So we tend not to do that. Um, we can also see things like wheel tracks that the rovers have left behind, which I think is super cool because it shows the mark that we've left as humans on the surface of another planet. That just blows my mind. It's so cool. And we can see those wheel tracks from orbit a lot of the time as well. Um, in this case, we can see that the rover maybe had a little bit of trouble driving in this sand. And after Spirit got stuck in the sand about 10 years ago, we've realized that we have to be really careful what we drive the rovers through. And so if it looks like we're driving in something where the rover is slipping around, we'll actually stop and try to get out of that terrain or we'll figure out, is there a certain way that we need to drive to make sure the rover is not gonna get stuck. And there's a question coming in. Why is there a hole in the wheel on the selfie picture? So that's the next thing I was gonna talk about. <laughs> Great eye, good <laughs> eye there, my friend. So unfortunately, we can also see holes in the wheel. Um, and that's because if you look at the not sand dune part, the rocky part, Gale Crater is really, really rugged and the rocks are pointy and hard. And it's not like anything we've ever driven on on Mars before. If you look at pictures from like Spirit and Opportunity, they tend to be these really big, broad, flat planes because we went to these really safe places. We hadn't really landed rovers on the surface before the way that we did with these two in particular. And so we wanted to be super careful with them. But 
So we landed those in giant airbags that bounced around and then the airbags deflated and the rovers drove out. Curiosity, we landed with this crazy sky crane system that I am still amazed that it worked. We had never done anything like this on another planet before. And we couldn't even really test this technology on Earth because of the differences in the atmosphere and the gravity. So we basically like tested this whole thing end to end when we landed this $2 billion rover on the surface of Mars. And thankfully it worked. Like everybody was super, super happy about that. So if you wanna see what this looks like, if you go to YouTube and look for seven minutes of terror, you can see the landing video from Curiosity uh, and it shows you just how tricky this was. But it worked, so we're gonna use the same landing system on the Perseverance rover that launches to Mars this year, which is kind of like Curiosity 2.0. The rovers look very similar to each other. But one of the things we found driving around is that these rocks were punching holes in the wheels. The wheels still work just fine, we're driving okay, but we're keeping an eye on the holes with things like these selfies to make sure they don't get too big in a way where we might need to change the way or the type of um, the stuff that we want to drive over versus not with this rover. And these wheels are made out of aluminum that isn't much thicker than a pop can. But since we learned from this, we upgraded the wheels on the Perseverance rover and they're made out of titanium. So they're gonna be a little bit more rugged and hopefully we won't have this problem with the next rover. But this is what science and engineering is all about. You know, you learn from different things that come up uh, either good things or bad. And then you take that and you apply it to the next thing that you do. So it just, this just helped us learn something about Mars. We didn't know that the rocks here were going to be as hard as they were. And the rover still works. So, you know, cosmetically, it's not great that there's holes in the wheel, but as long as the rover's still working, it's, it's all good. And I mentioned before, if you get underneath that layer of dust on Mars, it's actually gray. And Curiosity is like the size of a minivan and it weighs over 2000 pounds. So sometimes when it drives over rocks, they break. Sometimes we do this on purpose to like take a sample. Sometimes we do it by accident if we just happen to drive over something and it breaks. Um, this is a case where we drove over a rock and it snapped open. And you can see the inside of it, the part that was not exposed to the oxygen in the atmosphere is still gray. And then the outside part is covered in this rusty dust. So once this broken rock now sits here on the surface of Mars for probably hundreds to thousands of years, if not more, eventually that will also turn red. A hey, quick question. This is from Anna, Alana, and Mama. Uh, what is the average cost to make a rover and then to get it to Mars? That's a good question. It totally depends on what you're sending on the rovers. So like Curiosity and Perseverance, since they're pretty much the same in a lot of ways. They're both about two and a half billion dollars for the rover and like getting it to Mars. Um, Spirit and Opportunity, they were much, much smaller and simpler rovers. Uh, they're also older technology. Those together were about $700 million. And I forget how much Pathfinder was, but it was a little bit less. I think it was somewhere around 400, sorry, $400 million. Um, so they're quite expensive, but they take a really long time. And the cool thing is like Curiosity took 10 years of development before it got to Mars. And now it's been operating for uh, eight years now. So these actually keep a lot of people employed for a really long time. Um, so even though they cost a lot of money, they generate tons of jobs and they generate a ton of enthusiasm. I mean, we're all here because we think Mars is great. Um, so it's cool to see like the benefits of doing things like these missions. Uh, let's see. So I forgot to update this. Usually I update these with pictures that were taken like today or yesterday on Mars. So this image is from, I think last weekend. But if you go to the mars.nasa.gov website, you can actually see the raw images from the rovers on Mars as they come in. So you're basically seeing them at the same time as the people that work on the missions. Uh, so this is one of the views that came in last weekend. This is a shadow of the arm. And this thing sticking down here, I think you guys can see my mouse. This is the end of the arm where the camera is. There's also a bunch of other instruments on it. So it turns like this to pick which instrument we want to use at any given time. And that was mars.nasa.gov, is that right? Yeah. And there you can find stuff about all the missions that are at Mars right now, or at least all the NASA missions. There's some missions as well that are not from NASA. We'll talk about those later. Um, and you can see the missions that are coming up as well. 
So the other mission that we have at Mars right now uh, is InSight. And InSight is a lander that means it's not going anywhere. It doesn't have any wheels. And this is a mission that's specifically designed to look at the inside of Mars. So it has to stay in one place and not move. And it has to be really, really stable because it's looking for two main things. One is Mars quakes. So one of you asked about that before. We'll talk about that on the next slide. And one of them is to look at the interior temperature of Mars. So this long thing that's underground over here, this is a, a heat flow probe that they're drilling into the surface or subsurface of Mars to figure out if there's any kind of volcanic activity or maybe the core is still alive somewhere inside that it's enough that we don't see any expression of that on the surface. Like I said before, the volcanoes aren't erupting, but maybe there's still some kind of heat inside of Mars. We don't actually know. So we're still, working on getting data from that instrument. Unfortunately, that drill got stuck for many, many months, but just uh, near the end of March, they finally got it working again. So once that keeps drilling, things should be good to go. But we have gotten data from the seismometer. And this is what it looks like when the, the mission was deploying these instruments. And it did it by using a little crane, kind of like the thing that you use at the mall to like get stuffed animals out. So these are actual images from the lander on Mars putting out these instruments. This is the seismometer to look for the Mars quakes. It's attached to the lander with a cable because we don't quite have Wi-Fi on Mars yet like for stuff like this. And then we put this little shield on top of it so that it won't get jostled around by things like the wind because we don't want it to be a windy day and trick the seismometer into thinking that we've measured a Mars quake. And then this is the heat flow probe instrument. So this is a little, what we call self hammering mole as it burrows its way down underground to figure out the temperature. And the cool thing is that we have discovered Mars quakes with the seismometer instrument. And this is a huge discovery for Mars because we've never seen these before. And these have just been found in the last few months. And they seem to be coming from this area of Mars which is called Cerberus and Cerberus was uh, the dog that guarded the gates to hell in Roman mythology. So like I mentioned, everything on Mars tends to be named after war and evil things and stuff like that, <laughs> which is a, a little depressing, I guess, but uh, it teaches you about mythology and the creative imaginations of the Romans. <laughs> um, but this area is one of the youngest volcanic regions on Mars, which gives us a look into whether maybe there's some like tiny amount of volcanic activity still happening underground there. And the quakes that we measured here are actually relatively big. We've seen them ranging from like magnitude three to magnitude four. And if you live in a place where you don't have earthquakes, that's basically the equivalent of like sitting in your chair in your house and a really big truck drives by. So your chair shakes like just a little bit. That's what it would feel like. It's not like pictures falling off the walls or anything like that. But it's pretty big for a planet that we thought five, 10 years ago was geologically dead. So I think that the things that we learned from the InSight lander are really gonna change our view of the inside of Mars and what's going on there. So InSight also takes images of Mars every day. It's not quite as interesting as Curiosity because it's not moving anywhere. So the images are pretty much the same all the time, just depends on the time of day. Uh, but this is a view from last Sunday of the seismometer out on the surface with the cable. And you can see the cable actually looks like it's getting pretty dusty just sitting out there. Both InSight and Curiosity have weather stations on board. And so when you go to the mars.nasa.gov, you can actually see the latest weather reports from these missions. This one is a few days old. This is from March 30th. And at um, Elysium Planitia, where InSight is, the high, the high was 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was really cold. And then the low, like overnight low, was negative 135 Fahrenheit. And right now it's, uh, oh gosh, I think it's springtime. Well, this is in the Northern Hemisphere. It's fall right now where this is. So in winter, it's gonna get even colder than this. Um, it's at the equator, it's pretty close to the equator. So the temperatures don't swing hugely compared to other places on Mars, but it's still gonna get even colder than this as we go towards winter. Um, so you can go every single day and see what the weather is like for both Insight and Curiosity, which is really cool. 
And one of the things I always, and I think I've heard some of you uh, Mars scientists say this, think of insight as like, Dr. Insight. It came to take the temperature. It came to measure the heartbeat of Mars as it drills down. So you can kind of think of those Mars quakes as bump, bump, a little bit of the heartbeat. So I always kind of like to think of the Insight lander, like Dr. Insight, who's there to kind of really check on the health of the planet and what's going on down deep inside it. I like that description. I haven't heard that before, but I'm totally going to steal that if that's okay. You totally can. <laughs> I heard it from somebody else that I don't know who. Oh, nice. <laughs> Um, so those are the two missions that are active on the surface right now. Um, we also have a ton of satellites that are currently orbiting Mars, and we're not going to go into them here because there's too many, which is a good problem to have, I guess. Um, right now, NASA has three satellites orbiting Mars. Mars Odyssey, which has been there since 2001. So it has been operating around Mars since I was in high school, which is crazy. Um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which got there in 2006 and the MAVEN mission, which is a mission designed specifically to study the atmosphere of Mars, which got there in 2014. Uh, the European Space Agency, which is made up of a bunch of different countries in Europe, and uh, Canada also participates a little bit as well. Um, they've all come together to launch missions as a group of countries to make it easier because space missions are very expensive. Um, they have uh, one mission called Mars Express, which took images like that nice limb view where you could see the atmosphere. That got there in 2003. And the Mars Trace Gas Orbiter, which is looking for signs of methane in the atmosphere of Mars. And that got there in 2016. And then India also has a mission at Mars right now called the Mars Orbiter Mission, which we call MOM for short. Um, and that mission was designed to look for methane on Mars, but the methane instrument failed. So now it's just been taking really cool colored images of Mars. Um, if you look on Google, you can find some of them. Uh, it takes like really cool pictures of the whole planet and then some like nice cool color close-ups of like clouds and volcanoes and stuff like that. So these are all things that are at Mars and what's coming up in the next few years. Um, I need to update this slide because I think the European rover or the European rover has been delayed at this point. Um, the Perseverance rover from NASA is going to launch in July of this year. It looks like everything is still going to happen despite stuff being shut down. Uh, the timeline looks like it's okay. Europe was going to send a rover to Mars this year. It's been delayed to either 2022 or 2024 because the Mars launch windows happen every two years. Just happen, it has to be when Mars and Earth are like in good positions relative to each other. Uh, and China is also planning on sending a rover to Mars. Uh, it was supposed to launch this year. I don't know if it's been delayed or not with the stuff that's been going on, but we'll see. That's pretty cool because they've never sent a rover to Mars before. So I'm excited to see what they come up with. Um, in the mid-2020s, SpaceX and Elon Musk, they're planning to launch their Starship to Mars. Um, they haven't had a lot of luck lately with some of their tests, so I hope everything gets back on track for them so that they can do some more launches for that, so stay tuned. Uh, in the late 2020s, we're going to send a mission to Mars that's going to go and collect a little lunchbox of samples that the Perseverance rover is ca caching for us. So it's going to take all these little drill cores, stick them in a box, leave that box behind and drive off. And then another rover that's being built by the Europeans is going to come. It's called the Fetch rover. It's going to fetch that lunchbox and send it back to Earth. So we can look at these samples in labs here on Earth to look for things like signs of life um, and other experiments that are too big and complicated for us to run with rovers on the surface of Mars right now. And then in the 2030s, that's when NASA is planning on sending humans to Mars. Their goal is to send humans to fly around Mars around 2030 to make sure that we can get to Mars and come back safely. And then they want to send humans to the surface of Mars. And hopefully we can start putting down some of the routes that we need to have permanent bases on Mars and send humans there to stay. I always like to end the presentations with this view, even though it's from a mission that's not active anymore. This is sunset on Mars as viewed by the Spirit rover back in 2008 or so. And the sunsets on Mars are blue because of all that pink red dust in the atmosphere. It scatters the light differently than the sunsets here on Earth. And I think this is really cool because even though we're two separate planets, it shows that we still orbit the same sun and there's still some things that we have in common and can understand between each other. This is lovely. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you will stop your screen share, guys, we're gonna go to a gallery view. We have a few moments to ask questions. So uh, Lucas, I see you. What is your question, sir? Um, here's something I wonder. Okay. Um, was the last thing that, um, that she said was that Mars had that sunrises? Mm -hmm. Yes, sunrises and sunsets. Again, uh, realize this, Lucas, Mars is, you know, we're about 93 million miles from our sun, Mars. Which you is know. one astronomical unit. Thank you, perfection. And uh, it's about 143 million miles to Mars. So it's just further away, but it's still gonna get a sunrise and a sunset. What she's saying is because of the way that that pink and red dust kind of like filters uh, the light and everything, their sunset is blue. You know how our suns are, are kind of golden and pink and orange and that kind of lithium sunset that just feels good to everybody. Imagine sitting on Mars and watching a blue sunset. A little bit of a mind twist, huh? I love that you know that's an astronomical. Yeah, I'm just gonna get an update on the water back. That's All right, good, good. <laughs> All right, so Judah, coming over here to my friend Judah, who loves beets. What's your question? Victoria and Seth and you guys, I'm going to come around. So just know I'm coming to you. I just want to show the... Um, oh, I got to put you on speaker view for that one. What is this? It's the uh, like base that you wanted us to draw. Oh, I love that you created their Martian base. You have to take a picture of this and scan it in. Now, would you do this for me? Can you notate what each of those places are. So I'll really know that you've thought about each of your sections of how we're gonna do our habitats there. Beautiful work, hon, thank you. All right, so Victoria, I saw your hand, sweetheart. What's your question? What? <laughs> That's all right, I'm gonna come back to you. So Tapa Sweeney, you've got a couple of, uh, I'm gonna unmute you so you can ask your question. She was asking, Top of Swinney, uh, what are your, you ask questions about the reconnaissance orbiter. Uh, Top of Swinney lives in India. And then you had some other about. Yeah, uh, my question was. Go right ahead, my sweet. Um, uh, my first question was that uh, there is a deep pit seen on the surface of Mars by the Renaissance orbiter. So what exactly is that? The deep pit that the reconnaissance orbiter maybe has picked up a picture of? Oh, I think I know which one you're talking about. Um, they're like the pits where we can't see the bottom of them. Yeah. Okay. So we think that those are what we call collapsed lava tubes. So there are places on Earth where if you have lava flowing underground, the way the lava cools off, it cools off from the outside in. And so you end up getting this like crust around the outside with the liquid lava still flowing through it. And then over time, when the volcanic activity stops, you still have the cave behind that that lava was flowing through. And then the edges are made up of the dried up lava. Um, and so we tend to see those like underground around lots of volcanoes here on Earth. And we think what's happening on Mars is that we're seeing places where we have those lava tubes because we're seeing these, um, these pits in places that are really close to volcanoes. We think it's places where the roof of that has actually collapsed and it's so dark inside, we can't quite see the bottom in most cases. So those are really cool because they might make really good habitats for humans because you could basically just like stick an airlock on one side and stick an airlock on the other. And you've already got the the structure built for you and you just need to pump your atmosphere and everything inside of there plus you're underground so it protects you from radiation a little bit um if you look for like lava tube pictures here on earth they look really really cool um definitely check them out and i love jesse's got some names so the entrepreneur in our group is wants to call it a new treat on mars is going to be called the lava hot pocket or the <laughs> magma flavored super spicy hot pocket i love all of it i like Fantastic. it i would invest in that <laughs> <laughs> all right coming to you over here tynan where are you called like which city are you in my dear um 
North Carolina. Um, I'm near Asheville. Um, oh. but in a, in Alexander, I apparently I don't live in the city because I live just out in the country, kind of. All right, but I saw your hand raised. What's your question? Oh, uh, how does it feel like leaving Earth's atmosphere? Oh, that's a good question for an astronaut. But Tanya, do you want to say maybe what it feels like to a Mars rover to leave that atmosphere? Ooh, yeah, it's definitely tricky. It gets really, really hot as you're going up. Um, and then once you get out of the atmosphere, it's really, really cold. Um, yeah, I don't really know much more to say than that, but definitely save that question for Friday, I think you said. Janet, yeah, so an that is a, fan, a much cooler answer. Indeed. You'll talk to an astronaut on Friday. And do you say your name, Tynan, or how do you say your name? Tynan. Tynan. All right. Now I got it. All right. I'm going to come around and I see several hands. Taba Swinney, did you get all the rest of your answers? Because you had another one about polluting Earth or Mars. Let me take uh, Ander, Victoria, Seth. I see all of you guys. I'll be right with you, but let's get Tapa Swinney. Why don't you ask the last part of your question, hon? Did you have a question about um, the, if we, um, the pollution of Mars or something? Uh, so there are a lot of people are saying that we will uh, colonize Mars, but when we do, we may end up taking a lot of organic materials from Earth. So could this end up spoiling Mars? That's a good question. It's something that NASA thinks about a lot. They have an office called Planetary Protection where they wanna make sure that we don't contaminate Mars. And if there does happen to be any kind of bacterial life there, that, that doesn't contaminate us. Um, they, they think about it quite a bit. We actually have to take it into account whenever we plan to send missions there, depending on where they're going on the surface. Like we have to make sure that we um, sterilize any rovers or landers that are looking for life, or if they're going somewhere where there might be liquid water on Mars today. There's a few places where there could potentially be tiny little spurts or pockets of water underneath the surface. Um, we're still not entirely sure about that. So it's definitely something that they're thinking about, but it will get much, much harder once we send humans because humans require a lot of stuff and we're really dirty in terms of like, there's bacteria on our skin, there's bacteria inside our bodies. We need that bacteria to survive. We can't sterilize ourselves. We would, we would not do well if we didn't have any of that happy bacteria with us. Um, so it's definitely something that we have to think about and plan for as we figure out what we're gonna do when we send humans to Mars. Great question, hon. Huh? All right, so this is the order that I currently see. Ander, David, Victoria, Seth. All right, Ander, coming to you. with unslaked lime to soften the kernels and loosen the hulls. That was weird. I'm not sure what that was. So, uh, Sorry, um, I was trying to find out how tortillas are made. It's for my menu. Oh, okay. So what's your question, hon? Huh? Um, it's not really a question. It's more of a something. Um, so far on my menu, I figured out three entrees and three sides. Um, okay. Can I tell you one of my entrees? I uh, so, so absolutely, yes. Okay, would you rather hear about, well, I'm still working on one of the entrees. That, it's called the Ava Taco. It's an avocado <laughs> taco. I, you know what, I will, or, I'll order one from you today, man. But, so should I, which one do you, do you want me to tell you about the beat ball pizza or to beat this burger? I think you got to talk about the beat ball pizza because uh, Judah perked up on that one. So let's hear yeah. that one. Okay. Um, it's soy milk dough, ground up corn cheese with some flax in it beet meatballs with flax in it and a tomato and basil sauce. 
Ander, that is genius. Wait till we have somebody in a couple of weeks from NASA who works on what plants we should grow. You guys are going to be advising NASA next on the plants. So super good. I cannot wait to see all these menus. And Judah apparently is agreeing with you. All right. Uh, Julie, it's like I know Seth down there. Seth or William, uh, you had your hand raised. Which one are you? Seth. Seth. All right. What's your question? How high is the atmosphere? Uh, on Mars, so like how tall you can build the buildings? That's a good question. The atmosphere, it's a little tricky because as you go up, it, it's already pretty thin and it gets really, really wispy as you get up. I think the, the bulk of the atmosphere, like most of it, goes up to about 80 kilometers. Uh, and then after that, you get into what we call like the exosphere, where it's so wispy that um, there's not a whole lot left. But for some things like Olympus Mons, it's so tall that it actually almost pokes out the top of the atmosphere, which is really cool. That doesn't happen on Earth. I didn't even know that. That is super cool. Hey, Victoria, did you come up with your question? Uh, yeah. Uh, are we going to be able to live in the craters? Um, yeah, so with the Curiosity rover, we actually already landed inside of a crater on purpose. And um, with the Opportunity rover, we landed inside a crater by accident. We, we called it the hole in one because we had landed with this little airbag and then it bounced and bounced and bounced and ended up inside a crater, which was um, not planned, but pretty great for us from a science standpoint. Awesome. All right, David from New York coming to you. Um, um. Um, 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 were there ocean on Mars long ago? Was there an ocean on Mars long ago? So maybe we think that there might have been an ocean in the northern hemisphere of Mars. So like this area behind me up here, um, it's a lot lower than the southern hemisphere and it's really smooth. And there are a lot of giant channels that kind of empty out into it. And so a lot of times when you see like drawings or paintings or computer renderings of what Mars looked like way in the past, like three and a half, four billion years ago, it'll have an ocean in the Northern hemisphere. But we've been trying to find evidence of the ocean. Like we've been looking for shorelines, um, evidence of like marine sediments that you would find at the bottom of oceans. And it's been tricky. We haven't seen any, but it might just be that they've been erased over time because the ocean would have been so old. So we think there might have been this huge ocean up there, uh, but we're still trying to confirm it. We do know that there was a lot of water in other places. Like we have these river channels all over the place. There's gigantic flood channels. Actually, again, like right here, this behind me is a huge flood channel. And uh, over, over here, my finger is disappearing. Over this direction <laughs> where my hand is disappearing, this is another giant uh, flood channel over here. And then, like I said, Gale Crater, where Curiosity is, used to be a crater lake. So you know there was lots of water all over Mars in different pockets, but for now, it's all in the form of ice, and it's not nearly as extensive as it used to be. Fantastic. So in our last few moments together, will you share with folks kind of what you majored uh, in in college, got your bachelor's, your master's, your doctorate. What was that process like? And then we will, uh, I'll tell everybody uh, who has won some books today. Sure. So in, when I was an undergraduate in college, so my first round of college, I majored in astronomy and physics because I thought, oh, planets are in space. I should be an astronomer. But then I found out if I wanted to actually study a planet like Mars, I should have been a geologist instead. So for my master's degree, I switched to geology. And then I worked for a company that builds cameras for space missions like the rovers for a few years. And then I went back to school to get my PhD in geology specializing in planetary science. So like geo, earth, geology is to study the surface of the earth. But this way I had a specialization in looking at the surface of Mars as well. So that was pretty cool. All right, you guys, thank you so much. You are absolutely stunning and wonderful. So uh, 
the assignment, if you were going to give them an assignment, Dr. Harrison, what would you say that would be a good research or something they could do? Or maybe in the field of geology, is there some way they could go out if they can in their own backyard or someplace and find a rock? What do you think? What, do you, what kind of assignment would you give to them today? Hmm, that's a good question. All right. I guess I would maybe say, think of your favorite thing on earth. Like, is that a volcano or mountains or clouds or lakes, anything like that? What is your favorite thing about nature on earth other than trees? Cause we don't have trees on Mars. And then uh, you can look up what we've seen on Mars as those same things and kind of compare them. How are they similar and how are they different? I love this. So here's the assignment as I heard it. You're going to go to mars.nasa.gov or just Google Mars map and you are going to make a list of 10 things the earth has and 10 things that Mars has that are very similar. And if they are similar, but yet weirdly still a bit different, make a note, send that to me and I've got prizes. But I do want to give a couple of books away today. So Tanya, I may order some more books from you. So, but I want to <laughs> give a couple of books away today. So Tynan, I need your mom to send me your mailing address because you are one of our newest people here. So I'm going to need you to send that your mailing address uh, to Janet at janetsplanet.com. Same thing for you, David, uh, there in New York. I will need your parents to email me at janet at janetsplanet.com. So that's two of them. I'm going to, let's see, where's my newest girl that has added on? Raise your hand if you're my newest girl that you have not attended. All right, I see you over there. So what is, are you Celeste? All right, so Celeste, your mommy has to do the same thing. You have to email me at Janet at Janet'sPlanet.com. Give me your mailing address. I will spray it down with some good old Lysol because that's what you need to do to make sure everything doesn't have any germs on it and send it to you, all right? And Tanya, it looks like I'm gonna order some books, some more books <laughs> as anybody who completes the assignment today also gets uh, a chance at uh, getting one of Dr. Harrison's books. So without further ado, this time I'm gonna unmute you and it can be total chaos as you, like before I do this, think about how the Mars kind of salutation um, might be, how we would say hello on Mars or goodbye on Mars and then do it in that fashion. Are you guys ready? I'm about to unmute you all. Can I just tell you, I really stink and love you so much. You're so brilliant. The smartest kids on the planet, I'm quite certain. All right, everybody say thank you to Dr. Harrison. Thank you. And I have a question that I have to say. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Lucas, I, you know what? I don't like to leave something well, if something has gone unanswered. Bad. What's your question, baby? Um, it is, does, um, um, does the water on Mars vary in salt? Ooh. It does, yeah, probably. Yeah, kind of like it does here. You got freshwater lakes, you got saltwater stuff. I love your thought process. Yeah, you guys to... all had such amazing questions. Like, it's really obvious that you have been learning a lot about space yeah. through this. So it makes me so happy to see that you already know so much about space and so much about Mars. Thank you. Everybody say thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow, yeah, kiddos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay. Thanks so Bye. much, Dr. Harrison. Bye. 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 Bye